Welcome. Uh, I'm Bart Chan from the Voice newspaper, and today I'm at the National Gallery with Leslie Primo, an art historian. Hello, Leslie. Hello. Thank Hello. you very much for joining me today. Um, I'll be asking Leslie about his life and how he got into uh, art history, and we'll be finding a little bit more about his job and uh, what he likes to do. So, Leslie, first of all, uh, what's it like being an art historian and working at the National Gallery? Well, that's an interesting question. What's it like being an art historian? Um, it is rather um, strange. It's an esoteric world, the art world. Uh, it's a world where um, it is all about knowledge. It's a world of knowledge, essentially. And uh, the more you know, the more respected you are. The more knowledge you acquire, the more respected you are. What's it like working at the National Gallery? Well, it's a bit like, um, uh, it's a, bit like uh, a hobby. Really, looking at art for me started out as a hobby. And going to galleries was a hobby, it's something I did in my spare time after work or at weekends. And in fact, the gallery that I visited the most was the National Gallery. Uh, so uh, I'm still doing my hobby. Most of my hobbies have turned into careers. Uh, so this is a hobby that's turned into a career, and I still enjoy going to galleries. So when I'm on holiday, I go to galleries, I go to art galleries. Yeah. So you said in your before this became your full-time job, you used to do it in your spare time. Yeah. What, what got you interested in the art world and what made you go and spend your free time in these kind of places? I came at this from a rather oblique angle. Um, a, a very good friend of mine who's an archaeologist um, was very interested in and is very interested in Greek mythology and I got interested in Greek mythology as well and uh, we used to, it sounds as though it's some, somehow erudite or are very intelligent to be looking at Greek mythology, but actually you know, Greek mythology is just about, well, the usual sort of stuff that people get up to. Mm. Um, adultery, uh, fornication, all sorts of um, things like that. Um, uh, and really, I like those stories. And the stories themselves, I found, appeared in paintings, and that's what got me into the paintings, really, the stories in the paintings, and especially the stories about Greek mythology, that's what got me into it. But I think also I have to acknowledge that when I was about six years old or seven, um, I went on a school trip to the National Gallery. I didn't know it was the National Gallery then, yeah. uh, but I saw a picture in the gallery um, that I liked. I don't know who the artist was, I didn't know who it was then, and I've no idea what the picture even was of, mm. but I think I liked the colours. Uh, and when I came back to the National Gallery years later as an adult, that's the picture I was looking for, uh, and I eventually found it. It was a picture by Bronzino called The Allegory of Venus and Cupid. And uh, unlike a lot of people, I guess you, you found your specialisation, your, your area you'd like to work in quite late in life. Uh, yeah, in comparison to a lot of people who, after university, when they're 21 or so, they go on to do their career. Whereas you were. Mid thirties. Yes. Yes. Mid thirties. What were you doing before you discovered the art world? Well, before I discovered the art world, mm. um, I discovered the music world. Okay. So I was working in music. I um, didn't know what I could do in music. I, uh, so I taught myself to play piano and to play bass guitar, uh, and uh, and decided that if I wanted to succeed, I needed to go on a course. So I went and did a course. Uh, in how to compose and write music at an adult college called um, Morley College in Lambeth, in London. And uh, I learnt about music there. Um, I then realised that I needed to be able to buy the equipment to make the music. So then it took quite a while to save enough money to buy the equipment to make the music. So yeah, I was in music. But in fact, before that, I trained as a photographer. So I started as a photographer and then I went into music uh, and the music ended up making some records uh, and then ended up running a production company uh, out of my own bedroom uh, and in the early days of electronic music yeah. when computers only had one megabyte of memory uh, and then from there I ended up um, distributing my own record. Well, home life wasn't great. Mm. Uh, home life... Uh, was uh, violent, had a violent stepfather, uh, and the violence did um, um, happen quite a lot, mm. and it was mostly my mother who was being um, attacked, 
and myself as well, so there was violence at home. Uh, but there was also um, uh, the problem with um, dyslexia. Mm. It was never diagnosed at the time, and I had no idea what it was, and of course would never even comprehend what it was at the time. Um, so all of those things uh, had an effect on my life in school. But as a child, there's obviously no way that I would have been able to make that connection, that, that any of those things were having any effect at all on, on how I was at school. So I had no idea, really. Yes. And uh, your, your dyslexia was, I understand, was diagnosed quite late in life, actually. Yes, yeah, it wasn't diagnosed until 2003. Oh, and how did that come to be found out? Well, that happened, really, during my university, because I, uh, having left school with no qualifications in anything, Mm. and not being able to get into the sixth form as it was then uh, and not taking any exams um, I imagine, managed to get into university somehow uh, by luck I think I might maybe I, um, maybe they needed a quota maybe there was a quota That's all so I you, you think you're part of a positive discrimination or affirmative action affirmative so action yeah. maybe that was it because yeah. uh, I'm told that you need mm. O levels to get into university mm. but I don't have any um, so I was asked by the university to write a comparison piece on two paintings in the National Gallery yeah. and that was enough for an interview and from the interview I got in. Uh, however, because it was a part-time degree, because I couldn't do full-time because I couldn't afford it, I'm not from the background that would be able to afford to go to university, I had to work in the daytime and study in the evening. Um, in the third year of the degree, which was the penultimate year, of the degree, they discovered that I was dyslexic. And I understand that you began your life here at the National Gallery, mm -hmm. working your way up, so to speak. Yeah, when I started here at the National Gallery, um, of course I didn't have any qualifications. Mm -hmm. So of course you would expect that um, somewhere like the National Gallery is hardly going to employ somebody as a lecturer or art historian without any qualifications. Uh, and I knew this to be the case, so I essentially uh, got a job in the shop. Um, and this was a tip-off from a friend who had done a similar thing at the British Museum. My mm. friend who was an archaeologist, that's how he started. He started in the shop. So the shop was where I started. Um, there I didn't need any qualifications in art history. I just needed to be able to work a cash register and they would train me how to work a cash register. Uh, so that's, that's how I began. I see. Mm. And as a, as a member of the black community, do mm. you see a lot of other... Uh, Kind of diversity or minorities working in, in this profession, or was it? No, for a very long time, it was just me. Mm. So, a great and vulnerable, uh, venerable institution, the National Gallery, but uh, there were no other lecturers that looked like me um, in the National Gallery for quite some time, actually. Uh, indeed, there was a rather interesting story with um, uh, an art historian called Andrew Graham Dixon, yes. um, who I'm sure you're familiar with who I bumped into in the gallery, and uh, he asked me um, if I was working here and, and what did I do, and I said, uh, well, I give lectures, and he said, I thought you did. And I said, so how did you know that? And he said, well, my wife and kids went on a lecture tour of the National Gallery, and they said that, that the lecturer uh, looked a bit like you, and he was really, really good. Uh, so I wondered if it was you, and I said, well, um, yes. It could, it could only be me because <laughs> there was no other lecturers <laughs> in the National Gallery that were black, so so mm. it had to be me. Yeah. So yeah. So, so how does it feel uh, being pretty much uh, a unique figure in, in your profession, and not many other people of your of your ethnicity working around you? Does it does it make you feel special in some ways, or does it make you want to change the fact that you are so unique in this? this one? I mean, for me, um, it's not about being. Black. It's about being able to be good at what you do, mm. and and uh, and also to represent um, the gallery uh, in a way that is um, is is a good a good way to represent the gallery. I I don't. I, yes, it, there is a uniqueness about it, obviously, and mm. there is. Um, I suppose one can say you, you feel somewhat special, uh, but you do feel. I think you feel as though you're you're doing something that's going to make a difference. Mm. 
I'm, I hope that I'm doing something that's going to make a difference, and I hope that it will um, encourage other people from my sort of background or an ethnicity to be to be in the gallery. It's, I get very rare opportunities to do that because um, I very rarely see faces like myself as visitors to the gallery, and when they are here, I I, I do my utmost to try to make them feel as though they should be here. Mm. And uh, in your opinion, what is art? What is art? Art is life, and life is art, in my opinion. Uh, it is a mirror of our society, at whichever point in time that mirror is set up. So, works from the 16th century mirror the society of that time. And art tends to not pay any heed to um, transient things things that are just of the here and now. Somehow, good art rises above the here and now and has a resonance that um, continues throughout the centuries, years after the art has been made. And in many ways, some critics would say about great art, it was ahead of its time. And I think that's what they mean when they say ahead of its time, it, that it has um, its own existence in its own time. It's relevant, but it's also relevant beyond its years. This is a painting that I've had a long interest in, this painting by Peter Paul Rubens, an artist that was born in 1577 and dies in 1640, but arguably one of the most successful artists of all time. By the time he dies in 1640, he's incredibly wealthy. He's not only wealthy, but he's also knighted three times. He has a knighthood from the King of England in 1630, a knighthood from the Spanish King. He becomes a caballero, which is Spanish for Sir Peter Paul Rubens. And by the time he retires back home to Antwerp, he also has a title and a land to go with it. So three titles. And this picture here, the Judgment of Paris, is one of those pictures that, for me, is a sort of touchstone in art history because it is a story that is unsolvable, a story of the Judgment of Paris. Paris is the person just over here, the chap sitting down on the rock. And essentially, Paris has to make a decision between these three goddesses, which is the most beautiful goddess. And it's a tough decision, and a decision that's made even more difficult because all the goddesses decide that the best way that they can be chosen is to take their clothes off. So they disrobe, and poor old Paris has to award them this apple that he holds in his hand. One of these goddesses is going to get the apple. He's just got to decide which one. And as you can see, plainly, Paris is in a situation of a dilemma. He's typically male. He's got an apple. He wish he had three apples. Uh, if he had three apples, then he'd be fine. But he only has one and one of them has to get it. The goddesses bribe Paris, essentially. They bribe him, and they decide that the best way that they can do that is to offer him money. And the first goddess here, this is Hera, she offers money and offers him the kingdoms and rulership of wonderful lands across the seas and all that sort of stuff. Uh, the goddess over here, Pallas Minerva, or uh, uh, as it were, she offers strength and wisdom in battle, because that is what she is, the goddess of strength and wisdom in battle. Uh, she has this owl in the tree, and the owl up there in the tree, of course, the symbol that we denote to mean wisdom. Meanwhile, the goddess in the middle offers something that Paris cannot resist. The goddess in the middle offers Helen. Helen is the most beautiful woman on earth, and of course, Paris makes the fatally wrong decision. The decision that Paris makes is to, instead of going for the money, which is clearly the sort of thing I would have gone for, uh, he chooses not money or even wisdom. Essentially, Paris chooses lust. He's about to offer the apple to Minerva, should I say Venus, the goddess of love, or Aphrodite, if you want her Greek name. She, in the picture here, you can see, um, pretends to be somehow innocent and didn't realize that somehow that she would be chosen. And she looks at herself and in that knowing way and says, who, me? As though she didn't know what the outcome would be. Paris offers her the apple and that is the outcome of this contest, which is essentially a beauty contest. In the end, Greek mythology does come down to stories that are understandable. They're not 
esoteric stories. They're good old-fashioned stories, and this one is just a plain old-fashioned beauty contest. Venus wins. Paris rushes off to claim his prize of Helen. And, of course, we know what happens at the other end. Helen is already married. And Paris, of course, does not take no for an answer. What follows is the abduction of Helen of Troy. And, of course, we know what happens next. It's the Trojan War. So this picture is the prequel to the Trojan War. The man in this picture, Paris, son of King Priam, triggers a ten-year-long destructive war by making this wrong decision. And essentially, that's what paintings like this are all about. It's about a question of choice. What would you do if you were in the same position? Who would you choose from these three goddesses? And would it make a difference anyway? <laughs>